Well, thank you, Brother Craig, and good evening, brethren and sisters uh, and friends. It's nice to be back here at Paris Avenue again. It's a couple of years since we uh, haunted your area, uh, but uh, we'll be here for a few days, as you're aware. I've been asked to do a talk on David and Jonathan, consistent with the program that you're currently going through on the life of David. Uh, and I was glad to have an opportunity to, to have a look at uh, these wonderful servants of our God. Truly wonderful servants of our God, aren't they? David and Jonathan. We're going to learn quite a few lessons from them this evening. The aims of the study, as far as I'm concerned, are that always when you come to do a character study, it's very personal, isn't it? Because we can actually put ourselves alongside of the characters and we can compare ourselves with them and that's precisely what we are asked to do, to have a look at ourselves in relation to former servants of our God and to see whether or not we measure up to them. And if we don't, well, of course, perhaps we've still got time to do something about that. So self-examination and comparison is, is one of the aims of this study. Also, we want to review the possibilities of faith, what it can accomplish uh, when the truth is being defended, as we're going to see Jonathan and David do precisely that. And, of course, we want to consider the value of true friendship in the way of truth, age being no barrier, because we know that David and Jonathan were not the same age. There was a considerable age difference between those two men. And finally, we want to ponder the critical importance of keeping covenants when under duress and pressure. And we're going to see Jonathan placed under enormous pressure to keep his covenant that he made before God uh, with David on several occasions. So that's going to be the aims of our study. I want to take you back, though, to 1 Samuel chapter 13, if you would, because it's back here that we first meet Jonathan uh, as a man of faith of incredible faith as he attacks the Philistines with his armour bearer. We just need to get the, our bearings straight on what was happening here in 1 Samuel 13. If you come to verse 16, for example, it says, And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with him abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. Now, there's a little map here. I'm not sure whether it's very clear. Of course, you'd need, a, you'd need binoculars from the back there, Craig, to see that. But that's Michmash there, where that black arrow is going down. That's the Philistine encampment. This is supposedly over here, um, Saul's forces at Migron, he was at the time. Uh, this is Gibeah of Benjamin, which, of course, was Saul's hometown. Uh, and this black arrow here is pointing to this pass that you can see. Okay, so this is the pass at Michmash. And we read certain things about uh, this, uh, this place in the record. Have a look at verse 23 of 1 Samuel 13. It says this, And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. So the Philistines had their encampment here uh, at Michmash, but about a half a mile to the south uh, of uh, Michmash was this pass. And so when you look at this picture, we're looking here from the south, basically towards the north, uh, up that way the north is, what we have here is the, the Philistine outpost. They, Michmash is over here somewhere and they've come down and they're, they're now here at this Philistine outpost, looking down over, of course, that pass. Meanwhile, we read in chapter 14 of 1 Samuel, at verse 1, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armour, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Now the Philistine garrison, of course, is over here and the outpost here. And here is Jonathan and his armour bearer. They're on the other side of this pass. So that's the, that's the story. Now, of course, we know that there was something quite awful in Israel in terms of defending uh, the, the land against the Philistines because at the end of chapter 13, I'm not going to read all of these verses, but if you were to scan down from verse 19 to 22, you will find that there was virtually no weapons in Israel at that time. There were only two swords. One belonged to Saul and the other belonged to Jonathan. Now, that's not a very uh, big armoury, is it, in order to defend yourself against the Philistines. The Philistines had made sure of that. They'd, they'd got rid of all the blacksmiths out of Israel. You wanted to sharpen any kind of tool, you had to go down to the land of the Philistines to do it. And so they had kept an iron grip, you might say, on Israel uh, by that means. So this is a bit of background of what happens here in chapter 14, because chapter 14 of 1 Samuel records an incredible act of faith by Jonathan and his armour-bearer. 
Now we read in verse 1, at the end of the verse, the last sentence says, but he told not his father. I wonder why he didn't tell Saul. Have a look at verse 3, end of the verse, the last sentence. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. Have a look at verse 7. And his armour bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. There's just two of them there. Just Jonathan and his armour bearer. So why didn't he tell Saul what he was doing? Saul was somewhere up over the way here in that map. He was up over the way uh, at Migron and he was looking out over Micmash but Jonathan's down at the pass and he's looking over at the Philistine outpost. He says, the time's come. The time has come for us to deal with the enemies of Israel. Well, why wouldn't you call Saul? You know, he's got 3,000 men up there, you know. So why wouldn't you call him? Jonathan did not see the faith in Israel that was required to deal with the problem of the Philistines. Why was it there were only two swords? Why was it that they're under the heel of the Philistines? Because his father had not got up and done something about it. That's what it, why Jonathan doesn't tell his father. You know, you have a, a, a read later on in this uh, chapter, you have a look at verse 17. When it finally dawns on Saul that something's happening, verse 17 says, Then Saul said unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who has gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armour bearer were not there. So it's just these two men. Now have a look what they do. They expose themselves to danger. They come down from that pass, they cross over to the other side, and they stand at the bottom of it. And they look up at the Philistines, and in verse 8 we read this, Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and will not go up unto them. Now think about that, brethren and sisters, and young people. I see there's a few young people in this hall. Think about that. What do you reckon their answer's going to be? When you say to the Philistines, they're up there, they've got the dominant position, they're looking down on you. Look, uh, <clears throat> we, if, yeah, we'll say to them, look, uh, uh, you come down to us. If, if that's what they say, we'll, we'll come down, you, you, they'll come down to us. Well, of course they're, they're not going to say that. That's ridiculous, isn't it? If you're up there, you're not going to say, look, hang on, you wait down there and we'll come down, we'll clamber down and expose ourselves to danger. You're not going to do that. Look at the next verse, verse 10. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up. Well, of course that's what they're going to say, aren't they? You come up, you clamber up the cliff, and while you're doing that, we'll be ready to pounce on you when you arrive, and you'll be puffed out when you get here. See, that's what they're going to say, of course. But look what he says at the end of verse 10. He says, for Yahweh hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. Now that's faith, isn't it? He did not take the easy course. He took the hard course. And he said, if that's what they say, then we will know God is with us. You reckon God's going to let him down? Of course not. He doesn't let men of faith like that down. And so we read in verse 11, and both of them discovered themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armour bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing or two. And Jonathan said unto his armour bearer, Look, we've got a sign. Let's go. Yahweh will be with us. Now that is incredible faith. And verses 13 to 16, of course, tell us that faith triumphs uh, despite the mortal danger into which they place themselves. Verse 13 says, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armour bearer after him. Think about that. Hands and feet. This is about climbing up the rocks, you know, and they're, they're climbing over rocks. They are in mortal danger. But when they get to the top, they clean up the Philistines good and proper. And we read, his armour bearer slew after him, verse, end of verse 13. And that first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armour bearer made, was about 20 men within, as it were, a half an acre of land. And there was a trembling in the host, says verse 15, in the field among all the people. And the garrison, the spoilers, and they also trembled. And God intervened, and the earth quaked. There was an earthquake. So it was a very great trembling. And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin knew that was something going on. And then they get involved, and there is a great slaughter of the Philistines. That's how this act of faith 
unfolds. But while it's happening, Saul is oblivious. As we saw in verse 17, he doesn't even know that Jonathan's not there. So here we get a little bit of indication of the man that we're dealing with in Jonathan. You know, tonight I'm going to do a little bit of contrasting between Jonathan and Saul. Though Jonathan never lost his respect for his father, there were times when that was truly tested. And he is one of them. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, from verses 24 to 28, Saul, at the height of the battle, makes a foolish oath. Look at verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until the evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. There was this oath of adjuration preventing anyone eating till sunset. Now, have you ever been out fighting all day? Let's just take working all day. Do you need to eat? Particularly if you're fighting, do you need to eat? Well, of course you do. Now, how foolish is that? This, this word here in verse 24, adjured, is about putting under an oath or a curse. This is about life and death. It was a despotic oath with a focus on Saul himself. That I may be avenged of my enemy. What about the enemies of Israel? What about the enemies of God? You know, Saul was self-focused. Jonathan was the exact opposite of that. In verse 26, the people feared the oath because they heard it, but Jonathan didn't hear it. In verse 27, Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath, wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand when they came across this, this uh, natural honeycomb where the, the wild bees had collected honey and it was, there was so much there it was drooping out. None of the people touched it because they'd heard the oath. Jonathan had not heard it. He comes along, he puts his staff in, puts it to his mouth, and his eyes are lightened up. And he says, that would be terrific, wouldn't it, if that had happened to everyone, when he finds out a little later on that his father has laid an oath on the people. Verse 28, Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. So what does Jonathan do? Well, he declares the folly of Saul's hasty oath. And in verse 29, he says, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I taste a little of this honey. How much more, if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For had there not now been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? That was his interest. Getting rid of the enemies of the truth. The enemies of Israel. It wasn't about him. Saul's oath was about him. Jonathan was interested in defending the ecclesia. That's the man we're dealing with when we come to Jonathan. Saul builds his first altar in verse 35. That was an achievement, wasn't it? His first altar. And then in verses 36 to 37, he makes a belated request of his God, which is ignored. But have a look at the exasperation of the people around him in verse 36. You know, he has denied them any food until sunset. Then he says in verse 36, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them under the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. The people were exhausted. He hadn't allowed them to eat. And he says, hang on, let's go and fight all night. But nothing to eat. And they said, oh, do whatever pleases you. They have had it. They have had it. There's an, a sense of exasperation about this people. And the same, of course, in verse 39, when Saul realises there's something wrong here. There's something seriously wrong because God had not answered him and the oath breaker has to be exposed he realises that there is an issue. And verse 39, For as Yahweh liveth, he said, which saved Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. They again show their exasperation with their new king. And verses 43 to 46, the people saved Jonathan on the grounds that God had worked through him to save Israel from the Philistines. And so Saul's oath of adjuration is broken. His foolish oath is left unfulfilled. Did that start the rot? Because, you know, Saul broke every single oath he made from here on. He only ever kept one oath in his life. You know that one? The one he made to the witch of Endor. 
He didn't have time to break that because he was dead the next day. He never kept any other oath in all of his life. That's Saul, the father of Jonathan. Jonathan is the absolute antithesis of his father. Well, why didn't Jonathan then, given the act of faith that we have seen in chapter 14, why didn't Jonathan deal with Goliath? Why was Goliath allowed to come out for 40 days in a row and defy the armies of Israel and cast aspersions upon the God of Israel? Why did that happen? Well, you see, it's more than likely that God didn't give him the sign that he needed. You see, the sign that he got back there in chapter 14, verses 8 to 10, was an indication that God would be with him. He hadn't received such a sign. In 1 Samuel chapter 13 and at verse 14, he knew something else as well. So you come back to chapter 13 and verse 14, perhaps verse 13. This is where Saul, his father, is rejected. And Samuel said to Saul in verse 13, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of Yahweh thy God, which, which he commanded thee. For now would Yahweh have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue, because God has sought him a man after his own heart. You know who's listening on to that? Jonathan, his son. If you look down to verse 16. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people that were present with him, Jonathan heard those words. Jonathan was the heir apparent. He was the one who would replace his father. When Saul died, he would become king. He now knows that that's not going to happen. He has such trust in the word of God through Samuel that he's confident now that he'll never be king. He also knows it, of course, from chapter 15 and verse 28, which was the second rejection of Saul. 15.28 says this, And Samuel said unto to Saul, Yahweh hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbour of thine that is better than thou. So Jonathan knows he's not going to be king, which is probably a reason also why he didn't go out and fight with Goliath. He was waiting for God to intervene. Perhaps he even suspected that David might turn up on the scene. We don't know. 1 Samuel 14, verses 1 and 17, of course, and we've had a look at those verses, suggests that Saul would have stood in the way of Jonathan anyway. You know, he tried, in a way, to stand in David's way, didn't he? He said, you're but a youth, a stripling. Here, wear my armour. So he probably would have stood in Jonathan's way if Jonathan said, look, Dad, I'll go out and deal with this idiot giant Goliath. Let me go and have a go at him. Saul would have said, no, son, you know, you're my heir and I want my kingdom to continue. I want my dynasty to, to proceed. You're not going to expose yourself to that kind of danger. Now, there may be several reasons why Jonathan didn't do the job. But, you know, there's another issue that comes up here. There seems to be a problem with David's origins. I want to just work you through this, brethren and sisters. There seems to be a problem. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, which of course is the preparation for the killing of Goliath, we read this in verses 28 and 29, when David is sent by Jesse with supplies for his brothers, we read in verse 28, and Elias, Eliab his eldest brother heard him when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep? Look at the you can see that the bitterness in this, can't you, in his older brother. Those few sheep in the wilderness. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You know, we know that siblings do often have differences of opinion. Now, that's not an unusual thing, is it, for brothers and sisters, particularly brothers, uh, to have a little difference of opinion, particularly when it's about, you know, the power of your arm. What are you doing up here, you little whippersnapper? Get out of here. But you know that's worse than that. He's accusing him of pride. He's saying he's not worth anything. He's got a few sheep out on the hillside. He's saying, of course, that he's come up there because he really wants to see the excitement of war. He's not really interested in the outcome at all. You know, he's being accused of things which were simply not true. And it's quite clear that his brothers despised him and they could not speak kindly to him any more than Joseph's brothers could speak kindly to him because of the quality of Joseph. So there's a problem here, and I want to just explore it with you. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 55, we read, we read this. Verse 55 says that when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Well, he said, You better find out. 
verse 56. And the king said, inquire thou whose son the stripling is. Now, hang on, let's just pause for a second. Didn't Saul know David? Well, of course he did. Just come back to chapter 16. 1 Samuel 16, verses 19 to 23. Having been counselled that he needed a man who could play well, someone piped up with the name David, the Bethlehemite. And in verse 19 we read this. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass and sent it off with David. Verse 21, David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly. And he became his armour bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Look, can you leave your boy here a bit longer? And he, he, uh, he found favour. He's found favour in my sight. I want him to stay and stand before me. So, of course, Saul knew who David was. He'd had him in his court. So what's chapter 17 and verses 55 and 56 about? Well, it's about his origins. You see, Saul had made a promise. And the promise was, and we read it back there in chapter 17, that the man who kills Goliath will have Merab, my oldest daughter, to wife. Now, most brethren in this hall who have daughters to marry off do have some concerns about who their daughter's going to marry. I had three daughters, and some of my concerns have been realised. So, you know, you do have concerns about who your daughters marry, don't you? And here is a king. Here's a man in purple. Here's a man in a palace, so to speak. And here's a man of notoriety. And he wonders what kind of family he's going to have to marry his daughter into. So he's not talking about finding out about David. He wants to know whose son this stripling is. He wants to know the family status. What sort of bank balance they've got. What kind of reputation they've got. That's what he wants to know. So he sends Abner out to find that information. Now, why is he asking that? Well, you see, he might have some suspicions. And those suspicions are realised when Abner comes back with the news. Verse 57 of chapter 17. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand, before he took it to Jerusalem, of course, and said, and Saul said to him, Look, uh, David, whose son are you? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And you know, things changed after that. We know that Jesse had eight sons. There are just seven mentioned in the first of Chronicles chapter 2. Probably one had died before Jesse himself. He had eight sons and the last of those eight sons uh, was David. But in, in 1 Samuel 17, 12, you read this about Jesse. It says, Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. What do you reckon that's on the end there? Every man gets old, don't they? It's inevitable. So why is that on there? Well, it's telling us something. Jesse was a very old man. In other words, he had no influence in the nation. And you know what? He didn't have much influence in his family either. We're going to find that out. Things were happening in his family, probably behind, well, obviously behind his back. And very sad things had happened, we believe, in Jesse's family, which, which brought some kind of shatter across the reputation of David, as we're going to find out. Because, you see, David is a wonderful type of our Lord Jesus Christ, as was, of course, Isaac, the son of Abraham. You know what they accuse, what uh, Ishmael accused Isaac of? He said, you're not the son of Abraham. You're the son of Abimelech. You were born of fornication. You know what they accused the Lord Jesus Christ of, brethren and sisters? We be not born of fornication, they said in John 8, 41. They accused him of being born of... We've heard about your mother. Yeah, she was with child before she got married. We've heard about that. See, I believe exactly the same thing happened in the case of David. I want to just take you through that. You know, in 1 Samuel 18, verse 2, we read something very, very interesting. It says this, second verse of chapter 18. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Well, why not? 
He said to David, you're not going home. I don't want my family to be identified with your family. If you have to marry my daughter, and that was his intention at this stage, of course we know what happened in the end, his intention was that David would take the hand of Merab in marriage. You're not going home. I don't want you to be seen to be associated with that family back there in Bethlehem. So you see, there must be reasons. His, his impending connection with Jesse's house is a cause of disgust to Saul. Why? Well, there were scandals in Jesse's family. That's why. Two of them. Scandals. Now, we wouldn't have scandals in our brotherhood, would we, today? Yes, it's happening today. And it's happened all through history. Even in some of the better families in our community, it happens. Now, I put that up there on the, on the screen behind me. There are two passages there. There's 2 Samuel 17, verse 25, and there's 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And the reason I've got them up there is because I want you to make some comparisons and you're going to see some contrasts. Now, you notice the words we've highlighted. This is, these two verses are essentially about the origins of, of Amasa. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab. And tells us that this man, uh, he, he was a man's son whose name was Ithra, an Israelite, that went in to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zeruiah, Joab's mother. Okay, got the story? First Chronicles chapter 2, however, says, David was the seventh son of Jesse, whose sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail, and the sons of Zeruiah, Abishai and Joab and Asahel were three, and Abigail bare Amasa, so here he is, and the father of Amasa was Jetha the Ishmaelite. Now the first thing we need to understand is that Ithra is a contraction of Jetha. It's the same individual, the same name. They're next door in Strong's Concordance, in the Hebrew Concordance, okay? Same person. So why the difference? Why does it call him an Israelite up here? Well, that's probably one of those... Uh, you know, corrections that have been made by copyists at some point. Why would you want to say that a man's an Israelite anyway? I mean, in this hall, do I need to say you're a Christadelphian? You don't need to say that, do you? We know that if you're in this hall, you're probably going to be a Christadelphian. So you wouldn't say that. The record of Chronicles actually tells us that this Jetha or Ithra was an Ishmaelite. And he probably wasn't a terribly uh, moral Ishmaelite. You know why? It says, he went in to Abigail. It means he seduced her. He went in to Abigail. It doesn't say he took her to wife. He went in to her. So there was a scandal involved in the birth of this Amasa. And she is said to be the daughter of Nahash. But hang on, hang on a minute. Second, First Chronicles 2, 15 and 17 says... That David was the, was the seventh, in fact he was the eighth, probably one of the sons had died. He was the seventh son of Jesse and his sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail. Now, if they were David's sisters and his father was Jesse, well, then who is the father of these two girls? Well, Jesse, isn't he? Well, he's not. He's not the father of Abigail. Because it says, Abigail, the daughter of Nahash. So you see, she's got a different father than David. What's that all about? Why not Jesse if she's David's sister? Well, Abigail, at least, was fathered by Nahash, not Jesse, via David's mother. There were two scandals in Jesse's house. All right, you had an Ishmaelite defiling Abigail and you had Nahash playing around, evidently, with Jesse's wife. He was an old man in those days. All right? Probably not up to the job of no noticing what was really going on behind his back. That's how I read that, brothers and sisters. So that's probably the reason why when Saul found out about this, he says, you're not going home, David. You're not going home. I'm not going to have my son-in-law associated with a family like that. You know that Saul was a Judaizer? 
He tried to get rid of witches. He even tried to kill off Gibeonites, didn't he? Why did he do that? Well, he did it out of zeal for Israel. Yes, that's the kind of zeal he had. Why wasn't David invited, do you think, to the feast in 1 Samuel chapter 16? I want you to come back to chapter 16. 1 says in verse 1 that Yahweh said to Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Go down and anoint a new king. Verse 2. Take a heifer, say that you've come to sacrifice to Yahweh. Verse 3. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. So he did that. And he comes to Bethlehem. And, of course, they tremble because, you know, when a priest brought along uh, a heifer, then there'd then been some kind of murder in the district. And they didn't know who had committed it. So he'd come along, and, and, and the nearest village would be quizzed as to whether they knew anything about this. So, well, has there been a murder here? He comes along... With a heifer. No, no, it's been no murder. But there's going to be an anointing. Look at verse 5. He says, No, I've come peaceably. I'm come to sacrifice unto Yahweh. Sanctify yourselves and come in with a sacrifice. And then it says, And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. You reckon David was invited? Well, of course he was. So David's invited to the feast. But he doesn't turn up, does he? Jesse doesn't. Ask him to be there? I wonder why. Was Jesse suspicious? If Abigail was not his daughter, and maybe not Zeruiah, then maybe maybe David isn't my boy either. And you know he's got a different skin colour to me. We read of David in verse 12 that he was ruddy, means reddish. Now that may be the evidence of being a shepherd and being out in the open. Or it might, in fact be birth colour. You know, there was a difference in colour. Verse 13, we read this. First Samuel 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So finally, as we know, David is called in after he's gone through the, the other boys. And none of them, none of them are favoured by Yahweh. He says, Jesse, didn't I, didn't I say bring all your sons? Well, yes. Well, have you got another one somewhere? Oh, well, uh, yes. Well, where is he? Oh, well, he's out with a sheep. Well, get him in here. Can you imagine, Samuel? So why, why is Jesse like that, do you think? Well, I believe it's because he's suspicious. That David might not in fact be his son, but we know from the scripture that David was his son. Okay? Now these brethren that he's anointed in the midst of here in verse 13. You know, in Psalm 23, and I want you to come to Psalm 23, we read this. I believe we read about his brothers. You know, the ones that upbraided him when he arrived at the battle in the Valley of Elah. In Psalm 23, this well-known psalm, we read these words in verse 5. <clears throat> thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Can I ask you where that might have been? Well, you're told. Thou anointest my head with oil. When was that? Well, in the house of Jesse. So was there a table prepared there? Yes. Did David sit down beside people? Yes. Who were those people? His own brothers. And you know what he calls them? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. His own brothers were his enemies. They too despised him. They too probably had suspicions about his origins. Okay? What about Psalm 51, a bit further on in the Psalms? Psalm 51, verse 5. In this psalm about his sin with Bathsheba, he says in verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. 
Now, we know that that generally could just refer to the acquisition of human nature. Well, I got my nature from my mother and my father. You got yours from there, didn't you? They passed on to me what they got from Adam. Yeah. So you could say, you know, in sort of general terms, that in sin my mother bare me. I think there may be more in it. In the sense that David later on knew that the children born before him had a different father to him, that his mother hadn't done the right thing. That's the way it seems to read. Were some questioning who David's father might be? As I said, that's exactly what they did to our Lord Jesus Christ in John 8, 41. We be not born of fornication. That, to my mind, makes David even a greater type of the Lord Jesus Christ than we know he already is. He's in the very same class, hated and despised by his own brethren. Well, you might say to me, why did you go through all that? Well, I went through all of that for one simple reason, and that's to take you to chapter 18, verse 1. 1 Samuel 18 and verse 1. It came to pass when he had made an end, that's when David had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, you reckon Jonathan didn't hear about these aspersions that had been cast on the family of Jesse? Well, of course. Of course he would have heard about them. You know, Abner was the type of fellow who would go around telling everyone, wouldn't he? He was the kingmaker, and he knew he knew that Jonathan would replace his father, so he would have gotten the ear of Jonathan and said, you know, you want to watch that young fella. You know, he belongs to a pretty ugly family. I believe Jonathan would have known. Didn't make one scrap of difference to him, brethren and sisters. Not one scrap of difference. He didn't judge David on the stories that were told about his family. He didn't judge him on his background. He judged him on his character. And when he heard David speak, he knew what kind of character he was in front of. So here we see an absolute contrast between the way that Jonathan regarded David and the way that Saul regarded David. And as soon as Saul got an opportunity, you know what he did? He got Merib and married her to another man. He did not fulfil his promise to David. And it was only because Michael, his other daughter, demanded virtually that she'd be allowed to marry David, that he submitted to that. He didn't want David and his family. But Jonathan was different. He was unconcerned about status or background. He loved David for purely spiritual reasons. And they were probably about 20 years apart in age. We know that David, when he killed Goliath, was probably somewhere in his late teens, thereabouts, and we know, when you work out the figures, that Jonathan was probably around 40 or in his 40s. And you know, that's an unusual thing, isn't it, for someone in their 40s to have a friendship such as develops between these two men when you have that kind of age range. Well, I have, I have been blessed in my life with having a number of friends, one or two in particular, one in your continent, who happens to be about 30 years older than me. And we have an absolutely wonderful relationship in the truth. Just wonderful. So I've got a little bit of a taste what it must have been like for Jonathan and David. You know why that relationship exists? It's not because we come from the same background or even the same place or the same country. It exists because we love the truth and we share the truth together. We have the same objectives in the truth. We want to see the same things achieved in the truth. That's why it comes from the love of God and the love of the truth. Three times it's stated that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. You know, I, I hesitate to mention this. I don't know whether I should mention it, brethren and sisters, but we have in our community people who have used the passage in 2 Samuel 1 that Jonathan and David's love exceeded that 
of the love of women. We've had people use that for absolutely horrendous reasons. And I don't think I need to tell you what I mean. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now, I get angry about some things, but nothing angers me like that. When they talk about the love between Jonathan and David in that context, I can ring necks. I shouldn't, but I can ring necks. I am bitterly angry about that. It demeans what the scripture portrays so beautifully here in this wonderful relationship between these two men. In verse 4, here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we read this. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. You know, that robe belonged to the heir to the throne. So he takes his robe off and gives it to David. And he did more than that. He gave his sword to David. Or oh, he did more than that. He gave his bow and his girdle. There were only two swords in the land, weren't there? So he gives one of the two swords in the land to David. You know what Jonathan is doing? Giving away his bow. He was identified with the bow, wasn't he? And his girdle, he's abdicating. He's abdicating the heirship of the kingdom. Here's this 40-something-year-old man who, when his father dies, is going to be king of Israel, at least in the line of succession. But he has heard the words that have been spoken by Samuel to his father. The kingdom's gone, Saul. It's gone. And he accepts it humbly accepts it. He knows that David's been anointed and he says to David, it's yours. Now think about that. That's humility, isn't it? Of the highest order. That's the kind of man we're dealing with with Jonathan. The absolute antithesis, of, co of course, of his father. And Jonathan's loyalty to David was sorely tested because of his loyalty to his father. He made three covenants with David. Let's have a quick look at them. 1 Samuel 18, verse 3. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Have a look at chapter 20 and verse 16. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let Yahweh even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And again in chapter 23 and verse 18. We read this. And they too made a covenant before Yahweh. And David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Three covenants were made between these two men. But they were put under pressure. Let's come back to chapter 19 and verses 1 and 2 and see the kind of pressure that came on Jonathan to break his covenant with David, made before his God. 1 Samuel 19 verse 1. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. You see, Saul speaks to Jonathan his son. And he says, I want you to go out and kill your friend. Now how is John Jonathan going to respond to this? Verse 2. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place. Go and hide, David. And I'm going to go to my father, he says in verse 3, and I'm going to try and sort him out. Now, he does his absolute best. But you know, he's up against a real problem, isn't he? You know, the problem is besetting our community today. It's the problem of blood being thicker than water. Do I need to spell that one out? I mean, even you, you know, in this country, you understand that better than what we understand in Australia. Every, every nation on earth, every Christadelphian ecclesia on earth has to wrestle with that problem. When you come to deal with issues in the ecclesia, all too often, blood proves to be thicker than the water of the word of God. And that's the problem that Jonathan is dealing with here. Because his father is telling him, now look, you want to be king, son? You've got to get rid of David. And so Jonathan does something quite marvellous. You know, he could have got very angry, couldn't he, with his father? It says in that passage that he delighted in David. He was inclined to David. 
And his method of dealing with Saul is quite marvellous. Have a look what he does here. Verse 4. And Jonathan spake good of David unto, his, unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee, thee were very good. He even put his life in his hand. He slew the Philistine. And Yahweh wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? Now he could have said to his father, Listen, get your act together, Dad. You're an idiot. He could have done that, couldn't he? But Jonathan didn't operate that way towards his father. He had respect to his father. He honoured his father. Didn't always agree with him, but he honoured him. So he handles this in a magnificently balanced way. You know what he does, brothers and sisters? He comes to his father and talks about the virtues of David. And having highlighted the virtues of David, he says, Dad, you wouldn't want to put it to death a man like that. Whatever his name was, would you? Oh, no, son, I'd never do that. And so Saul backs off. And Saul makes an oath in verse 6. He swear by the name of God, David will not be slain. Within days, of course, that oath was broken. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. And when you're dealing with problems in the family or problems in the ecclesia or problems inter-ecclesially, inter that rule should apply. You know, we cannot compromise the things of God. And Jonathan does it. He upholds what was right. He tells his father what was true. But he does it in the right way. He doesn't seek to get up people's noses. All right? Which is the human way, isn't it? We like to fight back. He puts forth a soft answer, but a true one. And that, for the time being anyway, resolves the problem. doesn't last all that long, sadly. This oath about David is broken. It's preceded by Saul openly campaigning against David's life. Jonathan's earnest intervention produces this oath, and within a short time, verse 10 tells us, he's, he's firing javelins uh, to try and pin David to the wall. So what's Saul's motivation? I haven't got time to take you through all that list there. We've had a look at a few of these passages. But Saul was being motivated by indignation, by jealousy. They've ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me, only thousands. That's terrible. Fear. The record says he feared David. Why would you fear any brother? Why would you fear a brother? Because he's got virtues you haven't got. That's why you might fear him. He's got obvious virtues that you don't have. And one day he's going to displace you. You're going to be off the AB. Someone else is going to be there. If I can put it in contemporary language. All right? That's why he was fearful. And he was motivated by pride. Jonathan was motivated by none of those fleshly issues, was he? He's the antithesis of his father. David's oaths were always kept too, you know. Jonathan's oaths were put under enormous pressure day after day. He had to hide from Saul to go down to the woods to see David for the last time. And David similarly had pressure put on him. In 1 Samuel 18 verse 3, Jonathan and David made the covenant of mutual loyalty. They both kept it. In 1 Samuel 20 verses 16 and 17, there was a covenant renewed with emphasis on preserving Jonathan's house. David kept that promise. In 1 Samuel 24, David made an oath to preserve Saul's name and his house. He kept that promise. In 1 Samuel 30 verse 15, he made an oath to a young Egyptian. In the wilderness, remember, after, after the attack by the Amalekites on, uh, on the city where he had left his family. Well, he kept that one too. You know, it shows you something, doesn't it? He, d he just didn't keep oaths to important people. He kept them to the lowliest of human beings. That was David. That's why David and Jonathan loved each other. They were covenant keepers together. And I'll tell you why I love you, brethren and sisters. 
You know why I love you? Most, if not all of you, are covenant keepers. And if I receive love from you, I don't want it to be for any other reason than that we are in the same covenant together. We have the same objectives. We're going to the same place by the same means. That's why I love you. And that's why in your ecclesia you should develop a love for your fellow brothers and sisters despite your occasional differences. If you don't have differences here, then please tell me your secret. Because wherever you are, you'll have differences. You have differences in your family? You ever argue with your wife or your husband? Of course you do on the odd occasion, don't you? If you didn't, you, you wouldn't be human. We're going to have differences. My wife and I have had our little differences from time to time. I deeply love her and she does the same for me. You know why? Because both of us love God more than we love each other. And that was the case with David and Jonathan. Both of them loved God more than they loved each other. And that's why they loved each other. That's the principle we learn. Jonathan, you know, was a true bow. I want to come to 2 Samuel because after his death, his, his tragic death, David wrote one of his many songs. 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 17 through 27. He writes this song called The Bow. We read in verse 17, And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Well, the words the use of are in italics. They can be crossed out. They're not there in the original text. He, he bade them, he, te he taught them this song called the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So he composed this lament for Jonathan and for Saul called the bow. It memorialises Jonathan's character as well as that of the author David. There was no sense of relief in the death of Saul. He doesn't say in this song, oh boy, I spent 10 years running away from him. And he wanted to butcher me. I'm glad he's gone. I'm glad he's left the ecclesia. Never said that. He lamented him. You know why? Because sadly he knew that Saul had done his dash. It's not going to be good for him at the judgment seat of Christ. David mourned over that. He lamented Jonathan because he'd lost a great friend. In you know, verse 22, we read this. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. You know why the bow of Jonathan turned not back? Well, it wasn't a deceitful bow. The bow represents his character. I want you to have a look at Psalm 78 and verse 57. Psalm 78. And here in Psalm 78, which of course speaks about David himself, towards the end we read this. Verse 57. Let's step back, verse, uh, verse 56 perhaps. Yet they, Israel, tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. You know what a deceitful bow is? It's a wonky one. And if you're going to have a bow that fires arrows straight, then it has to be a straight bow. I mean, if it's all wonky, when you go to pull it, one end pulls down harder than the other or whatever, the arrow goes all over the place. Arrows don't fire straight out of deceitful bows. This man, Jonathan, was a true bow. When he fired arrows, so to speak, and that represents teaching, you know, when you speak, the scripture says it's like firing an arrow. When he fired arrows, they went straight. Why? Because he was a straight man. He was not a deceitful bow. Have a look at Hosea 7 and verse 16. In Hosea chapter 7 and at verse 16 we read this. 
They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Israel was like that through their entire history. You know what Hosea does? It likens the nation of Israel to their first king. They could not keep covenant. They were crooked bows. But not Jonathan. He was different. And so we conclude in those words of 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 26 that, that Jonathan and David's love was wonderful. The word means to be marvellous. It's parla. Parla means to distinguish something, to separate by distinguishing. That's what that love was like. It was unique, unique to Christadelphians. You don't get that kind of love without the bonds of the truth. But when you have it, brothers and sisters, when you have it, you can even exceed that of the love of women. So what's our final piece of advice based upon the characters we've considered tonight? Value and honour your friends in the way of truth. Always esteeming others better than yourselves and you show that by what you do to get them into the kingdom. And make sure that you keep your covenants, firstly with your God and with those whom you love in the truth and with the least of men.